Hey everyone, uh, this is Craig and I want to welcome all of you to Christchurch Albany this morning. So glad that you are with us here today. Uh, it's an amazing thing that we have the technology that we do to uh, meet up and to come together the way we are. And uh, if you're online, if you're on the website, feel free to continue to chat throughout the time of this service. Uh, it's going to be probably the only time you can actually talk in service uh, because otherwise it'll be rude. So don't don't do that normally. But now you could do that. You could chat uh, and feel free to, to answer the questions or just chat about what you're experiencing there in the, in the service. Um, but also, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, you have anything that you would want us to uh, follow up with you on, uh, there, you could do that through the Connect card. And uh, right at the top of the page, there's a link that will take you to the Connect card where you can fill that out. Uh, but if you're on the YouTube, uh, watching this through YouTube, uh, you can look into the comment section and you'll find a link to go to the connect card through that way. But uh, even though we're not coming together physically, we can still definitely pray for each other and encourage each other. So uh, we'd love to hear from you in terms of what's going on with your in your life. Um, and if you're new here today, uh, just want to send a special welcome to you. Uh, we know that there are a lot of other things you can be doing and a lot of other places you could be. Uh, and so we're just grateful and glad that you're here with us today uh, and taking part of what we do every week. Uh, and so we'd love to get to know you. Uh, and if you give us some, some information, we'll be able to give you a gift. Uh, we'd love to send to you, which is a gift card uh, for the new coffee shop that opened up, Brutus. Uh, so you can get some coffee on us. So uh, we're just grateful, grateful you're here. So glad that you have decided to join us. and. Uh, just uh, let us know that you were here. Um, now, in terms of, for me, I don't know if this is true for, for you guys, it's this last two months have been difficult and good all at the same time. Difficult because being at home all the time can really get to you, you know, emotionally and not being able to kind of do the things you normally do. Uh, but also good because it slowed down life enough that I can appreciate my family in a different way and and have conversations and kind of interact in ways that we couldn't normally because we're just always flying around so so fast. So uh, try to use this time the best you can. It, it does not have to be uh, a, a gloomy time. It can definitely be something that's positive if we use it that way. Um, so as far as for today, just to give you an update in terms of what to expect, uh, right after I'm done speaking, you'll see one of our volunteer leaders, Stephen, who will lead us in two songs. Uh, and feel free, wherever you are, to sing, to dance, clap, break dance, whatever it is you want to do. Just do it to the Lord and that'll be fine. Uh, God does not concern himself about how we sound or if we can carry a tune or a tone. Uh, he just wants to see our hearts uh, being lifted to him and that's all he's concerned with. So feel free to continue to do that. Um, during that time. And right after Stephen is done, uh, John, is, our lead pastor, is going to come on and he's going to share uh, on 1 Corinthians, continuing the series on that. Uh, so he'll give a message then. And then right after he's done with the message, he will be giving, leading us in communion. Now, if you don't have um, any of the elements or the things you're going to use for communion, now would be a good time to go get it. Um, but as we've said, uh, communion is an idea. It's a it's a uh, something that we that we use to remember what Jesus has done. So, how, what elements and things we use is not as important as our heart towards it. And uh, so, while we're at home, whatever it is you have, is fine. Uh, so, for me, I got I just happen to have some grape juice, so I'll be, you know, using that. But I also just have some normal bread that I buy, and so you know, like this. Uh, I know it's burnt. It's okay. I like it this way, so don't worry about that, okay? <laughs> but whatever bread you have, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and so John will lead us in communion, and you can feel free to uh, follow along with us and join us doing that together. And when John is done, we'll uh, see Stephen one last time for a uh, final song before we leave uh, service today. Uh, one of the things that we always need to keep in mind is that generosity is a part of who we are as Christ followers. And we can be generous in a lot of different ways. And uh, we definitely could be generous with our time and, and uh, with ourselves. 
Uh, we're also going to be generous with our resources and our finances. And uh, if you feel led to give financially today, uh, there's a link at the top of the page. You can do that now or you can do it whatever you feel led to do it. But just know that uh, we appreciate uh, the generosity that you guys have shown, not just uh, all this time, but also in, in particularly during this time where it's uh, a lot of difficulties because of the coronavirus. And uh, so we will be faithful to use it the best way that we know how to fulfill the missions that God has for us. Um, now, before I leave, uh, I have one last thing that I need to do. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you as our special guest today. Uh, one of the things as we was talking about with the coronavirus is coronavirus is not like a U.S. thing or specific country thing. It's global. Uh, throughout the world, the people are being affected by it. Uh, and so as a church, we are, feel it's important to connect with other churches and, that are doing uh, God's work and trying to reach people in other countries. And one of those countries that we are partnering, uh, in, partnered in is in India. Uh, so I'd like to uh, introduce Ashley, who is the head of our missions team, uh, and she's going to be speaking with uh, a special guest today. Uh, his name is Merwin, and he is the director of the churches that we're partnered with in India. We are so grateful that he is doing all he does, and uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. Take away, Ashley. Well, thank you, Craig, so much for uh, getting us started this morning. Um, so our first question is, if you can just tell us a little bit about the ministry and, and what you do and, and why it's so important. Well, first of all, thank you, Ashley, for you know, inviting me and uh, uh, giving me this time to share about what we are doing. Uh, we uh, currently serve 355 children from 10 different vulnerable communities. Uh, who are marginalized and downtrodden in the society. So basically, these children are those who are deprived of their basic education and health. And even on a normal day, you know, they are unable to feed uh, their entire family three times a day. And malnourishment is a very common problem in all these children. And most importantly, we introduce these children to the only true living God because we strongly believe that only through the Lord Jesus Christ, they can have a living hope. And can you share a little bit about how the coronavirus outbreak has been impacting your ministry and what challenges it has brought on top of the ones that you already mentioned? I haven't seen a horrible situation uh, in our country like this before or in the places that we serve. Let me just go through a little bit. On 24th March, with just over four hours notice, our government enforced a complete nationwide lockdown for 21 days, just four hours notice. Mm. And now I leave it to your imagination uh, to guess what would have happened with over 1.3 billion people in, in panic mode. Mm -hmm. Now with the lockdown in place and extreme police brutality, so people stepping out of their homes, police would just come and hit them very badly mm -hmm. and they'll ask them to go back. And the first three days, three days were literally horrible. And another very uh, sad thing was the liquor shops were suddenly closed. So what happened, these fathers, they were not able to drink. And as a result of that, they started showing the frustration on their children and their wives. Mm -hmm. Just imagine a one room house, three or four children, plus their dad and mom, and a dad who constantly troubles their entire family. Mm -hmm. It was literally living in a hell. I would say. And that's the situation our children are facing. And mothers started pleading for help, you know, and one of the mother told her staff when she went to meet them, she said, I think hunger is going to take our lives before the virus is going to kill us. Mm. So that is the desperate situation our parents are facing and our children are really facing. And we are very concerned about their health 
and we don't know it's almost it's going to be the 50th day now after the lockdown since the lockdown and our healthcare system is also uh, not good enough mm-hmm. uh, it's very very minimal uh, and uh, i heard that even husbands are turning people off with minimal symptoms because they don't have enough beds mm-hmm. in their in the in the hospitals mm-hmm. so that is uh, one thing that we need, we need your prayers for Well, we certainly will be praying um, for all the things that you mentioned. Uh, Our church, of course, um, supports financially through through the donations that folks give every week, and we send a percentage to keep the work going in in the communities um, that we're we're serving with you all. In particular, there's one community that our church has really been involved in. Uh, Is there anything, if someone feels led to to find an, an extra way to support during this difficult time, is there anything that you would like to share about uh, what would be most helpful or impactful? First of all, I extend my sincere thanks, you know, to your church for, you know, your support all through these days. And if uh, our children are able to, uh, you know, be in a good position, uh, at least in a safe position, it's all because of your generosity that we were able to, you know, build them through over these years. Um, having said that, uh, Ashley, you know, the immediate thing that we are looking forward is to supply, supply them with dry ration so that, you know, they can have something to eat uh, in the midst of all these, you know, problems around. Mm-hmm. And uh, any family we reach out to, we, this is what we are hearing, that they don't have enough food to eat. And some of the families are just having one-time meal a day. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, as I, you know, started working with my staff over the past few days, I found that, you know, one dollar a day, you know, per family uh, can really uh, help them feed their entire family for three times a day. So uh, I would consider you, you know, you, uh, your church to think about it, pray about it. And if you uh, are led by God, we'll be so happy to, you know, um, deliver all these dry ration to these uh, families who are in desperate need. And as you've always been doing, you know, child sponsorship is one thing that we are looking forward to because there's so many children, you know, um, uh, and parents asking us every single day, can you please take us in? Can you please give us a future? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I would encourage you all to uh, reach out to Ashley. Uh, and if you're led by God, uh, you know, lives will be blessed and families will be blessed. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Merwin. And um, Jonathan is going to be putting my email address in the chat bar. So if you're interested in helping with any of those opportunities, you can certainly send me an email. Or we have the connection card um, tab on the, the online service. So if you want to click on the connection card tab and fill that out and say you're interested in helping, um, we will follow up with you and, and get you the details to be able to um, support Um, beyond what our church is already doing, if you feel so led. So I'm going to just end in a time of prayer here, and then we are going to pass it off to Stephen to do our worship time. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, for the ministry that our church gets to be a part of. Um, Even though uh, we're far away in um, physical distance, we are close in heart. Um, and our love for you unites us. Um, we, we pray for all the things that were shared today um, for the children, particularly um, that are facing food insecurity, um, perhaps parents that are struggling coming off of addiction, um, just um, the risk of getting ill. There's so many things, Lord, um, but we know that you're bigger than all of those things. We know that you're mighty. You are the great physician, you are um, our savior, and we trust that you will carry these communities through. Uh, We just thank you uh, for the opportunity to serve you. 
um, and that the church is, is not limited to our, our community here in Albany, but that we um, have these beautiful ties and relationships with others um, that are serving uh, around the world. And we just thank you so much for um, inviting us to be a part of their stories. Uh, and, and we praise you for all the ways that you've moved in the hearts of these children and how you'll continue to help them grow up to be able to love um, Jesus, to love one another, and to love the communities um, and the world around them. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your time. You are in our prayers, your, your people, your communities, the children and families that you serve are in our prayers. God bless you. Uh, good morning, Christ Church Albany. Um, so happy that you can come and worship um, virtually, but with us, everybody, us as a, as a church family. And um, I just wanted to start off with a psalm, a psalm that I read the other day. Um, psalm 66, 1 through 12. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride on our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. And I wanted to read just this little thought um, from Eugene Peterson <clears throat> about this passage. Every testing is designed to deepen and develop the life of faith. This psalmist's witness is impressive. He went through the worst that people could do to him. He experienced the best that God willed for him. When he sings, he does not catalog his scars. He pulsates praise. Let's sing together, God is able.
Well, good morning, everyone. My name is John. I'm the lead pastor here at Christ Church, and I am so glad that you are joining us this morning, however it is that you are joining us. So here's the question uh, for today. How big is your butt? Let me explain. Uh, here's one of the things that I think is true about all of us, is we all have these things that we know we ought to do, but we also have an excuse of why we haven't done it yet or why we don't want to do it. Uh, and so for instance, I know that I should eat well. I should eat broccoli and kale and quinoa, but I would rather eat sugar and carbs and bacon. And we always have an excuse. Uh, I think this has taken on uh, a special kind of new level since we have all gone into this quarantine because it's exposed a little bit of our excuses. Uh, for me, uh, we're here in my house and we don't have a garage in my house, uh, but we have a basement and in our basement we have a closet and that closet is just kind of the catch-all for junk in our house. I mean, it's just it, tools are in there that are disorganized. There's beach stuff that we put in there last year and I've never retouched it. Old Christmas decorations, toys, it's just disorganized and a mess. And I've thought for over a year now, I ought to go down there and get all that cleaned up and get stuff and throw it away and give it and recycle it and give it to the mission. You know, there's, I ought to do that. But I'm just so busy. I don't have enough time. You know, I, I don't have enough time just to spend it around the house doing that. And now all of a sudden I'm stuck in my house and I can't go anywhere. And I still haven't gotten the closet cleaned because I still have a new butt. Uh, I could clean the closet, but I would rather sit around and watch YouTube videos, but I would rather watch reruns of The Office, but I would rather do anything because I just really don't want to. And we all have these buts. And here's where it becomes a pretty important issue for us, uh, especially if you're a part of Christ Church Albany or you're thinking about becoming a part of Christ Church Albany. Because uh, we have this big mission uh, that we want to be people who love Jesus, who love each other, and love the world. And we're super serious about all those. And we take those all to a really high level. Like we believe that it is possible for you to have a real, authentic, intimate relationship with Jesus. Like you can actually live your life talking with Jesus. And you can spend so much time around Jesus that you end up starting to become like Jesus in every part of your life. Uh, we believe that with each other, that it's possible for you to have deep, meaningful friendships in your life. You can have the kind of friends that if you need something at three in the morning, you know exactly who to call. You have friends that you can take all the masks off and you can be exactly who you really are. And even when they know all your faults, even when they know all your cracks, they're still gonna love you and support you and encourage you to become better. And we believe that you can make a big difference in this world, that you can use your time, talent, energy to really make a big impact. And if you're watching, I'm guessing that you have some sort of a poll to take a next step in one or hopefully all of those areas. And you know that you should, and you know that you ought to, and maybe you even really, really want to, but there's something that's holding us back. Uh, our busyness, uh, our intention, our ability to be able to focus something. And if that's you, then I wanna let you know that you are not alone. Uh, you're not alone in the life of our church and you are not alone in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is actually full of stories of people who make excuses. Uh, one of the reoccurring uh, phrases in the Bible is this phrase, but I. Uh, there's a guy in the Bible named Abraham, and God called him and said, you're going to become the father of a great nation. But Abraham responded, but I am too old. Uh, God called a guy named Moses and said, you're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to try to lead my people out of slavery in Egypt. And Moses responded, but I, I don't speak well. God came to a guy named Gideon and said, I want you to free my people from the, from the nation of Midian. And Gideon responded, but I am the least of all the people in my family. God came to a guy named Jeremiah and said, I want you to prophesy to my people. But Jeremiah responded, but I am too young and I don't speak well. God came to a queen named Esther and said, I want you to try to save my people from genocide. Uh, but Esther replied, 
but I haven't been called by the king in over 30 days. Uh, God called a guy named Peter to come and follow him. And when Peter called Peter to follow him, Peter was out fishing. And he'd been fishing all night long and hadn't caught a thing. And Jesus called out to him and said, try to throw your nets on the other side. And if you do, I will show you something really miraculous. And Peter responded, but I have already been out all night long. And here's the interesting thing about all these stories is that that, that should have been the end. Uh, Jesus called Peter to throw his nuts on the other side, but I, and he didn't, and nothing happened. Uh, God called Abraham to become a father of the nation, but I am too old, excuse, and that was the end of it. But that was not the end of those stories. The story didn't end in but I, it didn't end in excuse. It ended with another phrase that is all throughout the Bible. It's this phrase, but God that with, by myself, but I, I can't do it, but with God, all things are possible. And it's real important how God does that. Because God doesn't come to any of those people. He doesn't go to Abraham and say, oh no, sure, you're not that old. You know, yeah, I think that you can do it and try to build up his self-esteem. Or, you know, sure Moses, I think you're actually a really good speaker. He's very honest about their inadequacies. And he's equally honest about how God can use people exactly as they are to do amazing things. So today we are uh, continuing in our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is a letter that was written 2,000 years ago, uh, preserved for us in the collection of books and letters uh, that we call the Bible. It was written by a guy named Paul, and it was written to a, uh, a, a city called Corinth. And Corinth was this real interesting place. Uh, it was a fairly uh, new city. It was a city that had been destroyed and then rebuilt. Uh, and it was a city that was incredibly status oriented. Uh, if you wanted to be a big deal in Corinth, then you needed to look right. You needed to have the right job. You needed to have lots of money. You needed to be well connected. And everybody in Corinth was trying to climb the ladder. Everyone was trying to be somebody. And into that culture, into that city, one day walked this guy named Paul. And Paul presented this brand new upside down message of Jesus that said, if you really wanna be somebody, it is not about having the most money. It is not about how great your job is and how much you make. It is not about how nice your, your house is. It's not about how well behaved your kids is. That all the things that the world values God values something that is even more important. And so Paul is writing this letter and uh, we're in the first chapter of uh, Corinthians here. And here's how he uh, starts this off. He says, brothers, think of what you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. And this is really interesting. Because this isn't in the introduction still of this letter. This is in chapter one of 1 Corinthians. And this is a group of people who are, they live in Corinth. I mean, they're trying to like get up the corporate ladder. They're trying to really be someone. And Paul seemingly is insulting them. Paul is reminding them like, hey, well, let's just remember who you are. You know, you guys are not wise. Uh, you are not influential. You are not of noble birth, which in Corinth would mean you're really not that important. Uh, you're really not that big of a deal. And now why would Paul do that? Is Paul trying to humiliate the people of Corinth? Is he trying to just like knock them down a peg? Not at all. Paul is trying to remind them that this is the way that Jesus works. Uh, one of the amazing things uh, about Jesus and, and all of Christianity and all of the Bible for that matter is how just like vulnerable and open and honest it is about failures and about faults. Because uh, what we all know is that I mean, we, we all have faults. We all have failures. You know, all of us have things that are not perfect about us. And what we normally try to do is we try to hide our failures. You know, we try to leverage our strengths and we try to... We, I don't want people to know about my mistakes. I don't want people to know about my failures. A uh, stupid example of that, that we've been doing this 
video sermon thing for a couple weeks now. And a couple weeks ago, I was reading a tutorial about the best ways to do a video, to do a sermon video. And one of the things they said is that you need to make sure you have the camera higher than you are. That way it's looking down on you because when a camera is looking down on you, this might be helpful advice for some of you, uh, then that's a more flattering view. But if it's right on or if it's shooting up, that's not as flattering. And so I tried it a couple weeks ago and I, I put the camera up a little bit higher and it, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice and flattering? But what I found is that when I put the camera higher, then whenever I look down to look at my Bible, it shows the bald spot on top of my head. And now, a lot of you know me when we could do real life services and you know that I'm going bald. That's not, you know, this big secret. But it's still something that I don't really like about myself. And it's something that I am tempted to hide from other people. And there's lots of things that I try to hide. There's lots of failings that I don't want people to know. There's lots of mistakes I make that I hope that other people don't bring up. And so what is Paul doing here? Paul's bringing up that, hey, I just want to remind all of you who you are, that in this status obsessed, you have to be the smartest person in the room. You guys really, you know, aren't really that smart. In this culture where you have to be influential, you know, how connected are you? You know, how big is your business growing? You know, how much have you been promoted? You guys really aren't that influential. And maybe you're really connected because of your family and what your family name is. None of you really come from any kind of a noble birth. Paul is saying, that's the exact kind of people that I use because that means that you're being honest. Uh, again, again and again in the Bible, this is what the Bible does, is it goes out of its way to let us know the weaknesses of people. Uh, we know about Noah, you know, Noah, the guy who built the ark, you know, amazing faith. But then it tells the story at the end of Noah's life where he got drunk and naked. Uh, we know about David, the great king of Israel. Uh, and it goes out of its way to say that he was an adulterer and a murderer and had a pride problem uh, and was a terrible father. We know that M Moses had a speech issue, a stutter issue. Uh, we know that Peter and all the rest of the disciples, uh, even though they started the early church, that when Jesus was being crucified, they were running away for their lives, you know, completely uncourageous. And many times throughout Jesus' ministry, we're at all kinds of big doubts. And even Paul, who's writing this letter, uh, who wrote most of the New Testament, this you know, hugely influential figure in, in uh, early Christianity and through all of Christianity, that he was someone who started off his life persecuting Christians, putting Christians in jail, killing Christians, and then later on in his life had all kinds of issues, was run out of towns, uh, was sometimes told uh, that he was a, a boring speaker one time when he was speaking. Uh, someone fell asleep it, it, because the sermon put him, uh, put him to sleep was that boring, I guess. Never a good feeling if you're a preacher. And the, the guy fell out the window and died. Uh, luckily, Paul could bring him back to life, which was a handy thing. Uh, in the letter that he wrote uh, to the Corinthian church, the second letter, the second Corinthians, he talks about that he had some sort of a disability uh, that he dealt with his whole life. And we don't really know what that was. Some people think it was a speech impediment that he had. Some people think because of some of the issues that he went through of uh, being shipwrecked and thrown in jail, maybe it was some sort of like uh, PTSD or maybe depression. Uh, but he struggled with something and he struggled with it his whole life. And we know about all these issues because the people who struggled with them talked about it, they shared it, say, here's the excuses I had, here's the, the, the reasons why I thought maybe God couldn't use me and God used me anyways. And that's the story of the Bible, is God using people even though they had reasons that they maybe thought they shouldn't be used. Uh, over this uh, quarantine, uh, there's been a documentary that's been showing on uh, ESPN and it's called The Last Dance, and it uh, features Michael Jordan in his last season uh, with, the, with the Bulls. And one of the things that talks about the documentary is a couple years before 1997, 1992, they put together uh, for the Olympics that year what they called the Dream Team. It was the first Dream Team. And it was supposed to be the greatest basketball team of all time. Uh, and you could argue that it was. I mean, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, David Robinson, just all these amazing basketball players. And it's a kind of a fun uh, 
exercise if you're ever uh, at a party, if you ever get to go to parties again, or you ever out to dinner, uh, to discuss like what what's your dream team? You know, you're gonna talk about movies. You know, if you're gonna put a movie together with like, what would your dream team of actors and actresses, director, you know, be? You know, if you were gonna go to an art show, what would be your dream team of artists that would you know make that show? Uh, if you were gonna have a dinner, you know, what would be the dream team of chefs that would put together that meal? And, and for God, as he's looking at the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago. And you know God loves the people that live in that city. And he wants the best for them. And he sees that they are living so selfish and so greedy. And just they are just not living a life that's going to be good for them. And he wants to present them with this new and better way to live. Well, what would God's dream team be to present this message? I mean, you think you need you know the best and the brightest and the smartest and the, and the most connected because that's what I think. I mean, when I think of the impact that we want to make here in our city of Albany, you know, and all the difference that we want to make, uh, I think, man, if we could put together a dream team uh, of, you know, of church, yeah, I mean, we would have, you know, if we could get like the mayor to come and be a part of our church, you know, or if we could get the governor to be a part of our church, or if we could get some professional athletes, or if we could get some movie stars, or, you know, if we could really get some people that were really important, really smart, you know, had huge, so, huge social media followings. I mean, if we could get some of those people to be the leaders and movers and shakers of our church, then then we could really do something. But But that's not what they had to change the city of Corinth. Instead, Paul is reminding them that, hey, you guys aren't all that wise. You're not all that influential. You don't come from great families. Here uh, with our church at Christ Church Albany, I mean, we have, you guys are amazing, but we're not the most connected people in the world. Uh, we're not the smartest people in the world. Uh, we're not the most, you know, we have overly busy schedules. Uh, we have very tight budgets. Uh, we have all kinds of other things competing for our time. I mean, surely there must be someone better to be able to do this. Uh, and what we talk about a lot is, you know what God's plan to reach your street is? You know what God's plan to be able to help the people who live on your street, the people that are lonely or elderly, uh, the people that are struggling with their parenting, the people that are struggling with addiction. Do you know what, do you know what God's plan is? It's you. He has chosen you. Do you know what God's plan is to help your family, to maybe put your family back together, to be able to help disciple your kids? Uh, it's you. Do you know what God's plan is for the 97,000 people that live here in Albany? Do you know what God's plan is for the people uh, who live in India that are struggling right now? Do you know what God's plan is to help change this whole world? It's us. And we could easily come up with a lot of buts, couldn't we? A but I, I don't know enough. But I'm so busy. Uh, but surely there must be someone that would be better qualified. But here's what... Paul said, uh, starting in verse 16, we'll read the whole thing. He said, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose on purpose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. God chose us because this is not a but I story. This is a but God story. And I love but God stories. Uh, before we go on, I want to share with you a story that uh, uh, someone in our church sent to me this week. Uh, and this is their but God story. Hello, my name is Pasquale. In the fall of 2005, I couldn't imagine wanting to live another day, but God. Fear, anxiety, and depression meant I always wanted to escape. Marijuana, alcohol were the binges that led to attempted suicide and eventually landing in a homeless shelter. My life would have radically changed when Jesus Christ rescued me from myself and began to change everything about me. Over the span of about a year, uh, parts of me 
change that I'd never believed could change. I began forgiving family members who had hurt me. I began asking for forgiveness from for people that I've hurt through my addiction, through my lying, and through the mistakes that had had brought me uh, to a point uh, of just not wanting to live anymore. I was grateful for the first time in my life for God, for the fact that He had mercy on me, the fact that He had had uh, grace on me all along, and that He was bringing me to a place where I would learn that the true meaning of life was to not worry uh, about myself, but to worry about the needs of others, to desire to help others, to desire to be uh, a vessel in, in the lives of, of other people. The people that I, I once never imagined spending uh, a moment of my life around, the homeless and needy, became a people group that the Lord gave me the grace to serve, and to serve for almost four years of my life. I was amazed at uh, the man that God was uh, making me. I, I was blown away. I, I could have never imagined that uh, living 29 years of life full of fear, anxiety, depression, and bitterness, and selfishness could lead to just a radical transformation and a, and a desire uh, to help other people. In this season, I, I see so many people that are hurting. And I feel like uh, this this is the season that uh, God has prepared me for, has prepared us as a church for. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to serve our community today, to bring a message of hope uh, in Jesus Christ to so many hurting people. I, I believe there's so many but God stories that we are about to see. Uh, I, I just hope and pray uh, as a church that uh, we can continue to be uh, the body of Christ uh, in our city and in our world. Thank you. Uh, I love that story of Pasquale. Uh, I love it because it's a story of someone who was at the end of the rope and they weren't sure what to do. And God came in and did something amazing in their life. And I love that story because I know it's not alone. That there's a lot of Pasquales in our world. There's a lot of people that are at the end of the rope. A lot of people that are giving up hope. A lot of people that have fallen back into addictions and feel like that they have no way to get out. And maybe some of those people are us. And I believe that God wants to do something. And even though we have excuses of why we can't, even though we've tried it before and we failed, but God wants to do something amazing. Uh, we're going to take communion together as we take every week. And as we get ready to take communion, uh, hopefully you have your bread and your juice. Uh, I have a tortilla and some juice today. Uh, I want to read you another uh, but God uh, phrase. And it, it's all throughout the Bible. If you want a fun Bible exercise, you can go into your Bible app uh, if you have that on your phone. Or you can uh, go to a website called BibleGateway.com. Great tool for uh, looking into the Bible. And you can... Put in that phrase, but God, and just look at all the times that it's used throughout the Bible. Of all these times that it, if it was up to humans just to do it, it would have gone nowhere. But when God got involved, when God got involved in a person's life, when God got involved in a church, when God got involved in a family, the whole thing changed. Uh, and this is uh, one of those. This is in a letter that, again, Paul wrote to another church, an uh, early church in a city called Ephesus. He says, as you... As for you, uh, this is in chapter 2 of Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. And man, that's, that's so many of our stories, isn't it? Where we just feel like we have these sins and transgressions and we just, we can't get over them on our own. Uh, that was Pasquale's story. Maybe that was your story. Uh, and then here's what it says in verse 4, though. It says, But God who is rich in love and mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. God has come to free us, to deliver us, to be able to give us a new story. And it's not because of us, it's because of him. So let's remember that as we take uh, the bread together.
since we take the juice together. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, help us to not be paralyzed by our excuses. Help us to know that you are a God who uses weak and flawed people because that's the only kind of people that there are. And help us to be people that are honest about our failings, honest about our weaknesses, and that way that when people see that something amazing is happening through our church, something amazing is happening through our families, they will know that it wasn't because we were so amazing, but because a God is so amazing that he can use people like us. Thank you, God. Amen. Uh, Stephen's going to sing one more song for us. Uh, we'd love to uh, see you again next week. Uh, maybe invite a friend to join us. Uh, we love you guys. Bye-bye. This next song is called Christ is Enough. Um, the words, the word, the first verse says, Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Um, during, during this time of quarantining and social distancing, um, I found that I have become a lot less busy, a lot less busy doing things, uh, whether it's driving kids around or going to activities, but I've also found myself doing a lot less Christian things, meaning serving, whether it's, um, you know, going places or helping people, it's, it's a lot more difficult. And um, with that being taken out of the equation, I felt like there's this, there's this peace in which maybe I have been filling a lot of my time and my devotion to Christ in just doing things. Um, <clears throat> and I've started to realize, like, if I could go nowhere and I could never help somebody else or serve anybody else or do something, I would still have, um, I would still have Christ and it would be, he would be enough. He'd be enough for me. And it's really, he's everything that I need. And that's something that I've been really trying to embrace, um, the past month or so and trying to realize in my life. So as you sing this song, think about, um, you know, how we can have everything kind of isolated from us, but we still have Christ. Christ is my reward, all my
and everything.